Uh, we're going to talk about machine learning from lab to production with Kubeflow. Uh, can people hear me OK? Yay! Awesome. Uh, oh, man, clicky button. OK, fine. No clicky button for Holden. Um, yeah. OK, so we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to talk about some of the sort of general background, which we think is useful to know if you're thinking about using Kubeflow. Uh, we'll talk about the problems that Kubeflow solves. Uh, we'll talk about sort of its design. And we'll talk a bit about how to use it. And then we'll finish off by telling you why you shouldn't use it. Because uh, that's, that's a great end to every, every talk, in my opinion. Uh, so I'm holding my preferred pronouns are she or her. Uh, it's tattooed on my wrists, which is really convenient in the mornings. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Google. Uh, I work on Apache Spark. Uh, I'm a PMC member. And uh, I contribute to a lot of other projects, including Kubeflow, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, we worked together at IBM back in the day. I'm a co-author of Learning Spark and High Performance Spark. That is not related to this Kubeflow talk in any particular way, but that should not stop you from buying those books. Um, I get royalties, and uh, every copy of High Performance Spark covers approximately one quarter of a cup of coffee in San Francisco. You, too, can help save a developer from turning to a life of enterprise support contracts. <laughs> um, you can, you can also follow me on Twitter. That won't save me from enterprise support contracts, but at least uh, you can read about why everything is terrible. Um, if you're interested in open source, uh, I've started doing code review live streams in open source. I think they're kind of fun. Uh, you can see how code reviews are maybe different when none of the participants know each other. And uh, we're all just kind of trying to guess sort of what people's intention is, because uh, we don't always do the best job communicating. And hopefully, um, this will get you interested in reviewing open source code as a way to learn more about projects. Um, and this is what I hope, because we have 450 open pull requests, and I am not getting to 450 open pull requests. Uh, that's not going to happen. Oh, yeah. And um, I'm organizing a data track at IT Next Amsterdam. If you want an excuse to visit Amsterdam, the CFP is open, and you should definitely submit talks. Um, that would be awesome, and uh, I'll let that, let that be fun. Hi, I'm Trevor Grant. I am from Chicago. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he and him. I, that's not a joke. Um, that's, I do various odd jobs around IBM. Um, data scientist, I'm evangelist, janitor. Um, that is a joke. You can laugh at that. All right. <clears throat> I'm a PMC on Apache Streams, Apache Mahout, and the Apache Community Development. Um, and a great guy to hit up for stickers. I've got stickers for days. Um, <clears throat> I, all right, this is a sidebar. I was recent, I'm from Chicago. I was recently running for political office. I actually have some of my campaign stickers, if you want to throw that on your laptop for a position I didn't win. Um, I'm putting on a uh, conference, an Apache Roadshow in Chicago. It's in May 13th and 14th, I think. Um, you're all welcome to come. It's going to be at three bars. Um, I'm also running the IoT track at ApacheCon North America, so if you're into IoT stuff, please come on down. The CFP just opened. You can find me on just about every um, thing that there is under the handle of Rock and Trevo, um, GitHub, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, I'm there. So, how many times have you been going into a job interview and there's some esoteric product you've never heard of. Or you're at a coffee shop and some hipsters are making fun of you because you don't know about this cool new tech thing. Or some other situation where there's somebody knows a buzzword and you don't know. Well, get ready for those days to be behind you. Because welcome to Kubeflow, where we have every buzzword and project and <laughs> library and pipelining tool and you name it, we've got it. You want to run TensorFlow with Spark on Jupyter Hub? I don't know. You, we, we can do it. We, you name it, everything. You, you forgot to say deep learning. Oh, on. yeah. Like, <laughs> how are we supposed to raise money in Silicon Valley? That's true. Um, so many is, options for deep learning. This is everything and anything you need to raise millions of dollars for a Series A in one easy to load command line. <laughs> <clears throat> little background of some things that we, we just want to level set and make sure everyone knows going in. 
Um, a quick history of predictive analytics. Ever since the dawn of time, people in positions of leadership have wanted to have someone they could scapegoat onto if things didn't go the way they thought they were. Um, the oracles and the magicians and whoever else they were, whoever could divinate the future, the leader would go and make an offering and they'd say, oh, I don't know, maybe attack when the moon is full. Um, that eventually became a little more systemized and we got things like tarot cards and palmistry and reading tea leaves. And finally, in, in say the 1700s-ish, um, we began to believe in math because math can't tell it. Math is like science and there's nothing that can go wrong there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so that, and, then, and thus was statistics. Statistics is the math of divination, if you will. Um, <clears throat> and there's lots of, of, you know, esoteric and deep learning you have to do. Not deep learning like the computer stuff, but like 12 years of school that you have to learn all these secret ways and means of being a statistician. And some people said, you know, I want to know how to do these things they can do, but I don't want to go to school for 12 years. I want to maybe make something that you can write a few lines of code, and instead of going to school for 12 years to learn how to do Bayesian causality, you can just six weeks, Metis boot camp, you're done. Machine learning. <clears throat> now, machine learning is just a thin veil though, over statistics, and people are still really afraid of math. How many people love math and they love just doing math every day? Oh, I'm pretty impressed. Okay, I mean, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a math degree too, but I, um, for everybody else in the room, oh, and the people who know math too, know that you get paid a lot because someone else doesn't want to do math and you're getting paid to do their homework for them. Right, right, right. And, and the key is, they, you know, statistics conferences, mm. way less money and machine learning conferences. Exactly. <clears throat> but you might have heard another word starting to float around recently, and that's because there were some marketing dorks and business nerds who said, I don't want anywhere, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere near mathematics. I need something new that it makes it so obfuscated away that it's just, it's like, it's like the good old days when it was just an oracle or a magician and an artificial intelligence. And now we've come full circle because the whole reason that we needed this in the first place was that we needed someone or something to blame when things went wrong. Um, and, you know, at first the oracles were pretty good. They were like, oh, yeah, you didn't make, a, you didn't make enough of an offering. That was, that's on you, not me. <laughs> but the, the people in power, they got wise pretty quick. And they were like, no, you made a, you're just not very good at guessing the future. Well, now we can do that again because we can blame the computer which is this abstract concept of this thing that doesn't even exist. Like, oh, I did the best I could, but the computer, it guessed wrong. Oh. Um, so <clears throat> along the lines of this analogy. But, but just to be clear, like, this isn't all flim flammery, right? Like, you, you actually can use it to find important things like cats. Um, <clears throat> you know. When I was in a freshman, my freshman biology class, my biology teacher, and I forget exactly the context, but he gave me the most important thing I learned in that freshman biology class, that um, when it comes to sex, drugs, and something else, you get what you pay for, and by pay a little more for the good stuff. And I would say machine learning and artificial intelligence is another case of that, too. So that's, that's why we're talking yeah. about free open source software. Free open source software. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Which, as everyone in this room knows, is only as good as the people you pay to run it. So... Um, Going back to this, model training, um, deep, like, have everybody seen Lord of the Rings? Like, Lord of the Rings, deep in, like, the heart of the mountain, there's orcs, and they're hammering out all their stuff, and that's your model training, and then things get brought up into the cloud where they just deliver answers down onto us from on high, um, as depicted by images left and right. And in this, we have our data scientists who uses some magic and generally doesn't necessarily know what they're doing because maybe they do. It depends on how good a one you decided you were going to pay for or your bosses did. Um, and they are going to need GPUs because that's what their data science boot camp told them. Um, 
GPUs make things go faster, so they need lots. Um, but GPUs are expensive, and you don't want to maybe necessarily buy, I mean, all right, sidebar, I work for IBM. The first thing you want to do is buy a GPU server from IBM. We have very nice ones, but maybe or, you don't. Or rent them from Google Cloud. Or rent them. <laughs> And that being said, we're both represent cloud providers, and we are happy to rent you as much GPU resources as you could possibly ever need. <laughs> but, um, oh, another call out. If you've heard of the TPUs from Google, that's a picture of one. Um, <laughs> a very scientific graph on how many GPUs you need versus how much you know what you're doing. Uh, it starts off high. You kind of realize, nah, maybe I don't. And then in some weird esoteric cases, and you really get deep into the weeds, maybe you do. Um, what is Kubernetes? Raise your hand if you don't know what Kubernetes is. Let's shame someone. No, hey, come <laughs> on, man. Don't do that. For the purposes of this talk, Kubernetes is containers plus magic. <laughs> Here we see our data scientist in the wild. And data, there's a lot of things that are important to data scientists. And one of the most important things a data scientist is making sure everyone knows that they are a data scientist. So they often want to take their MacBook to their local coffee shop and write their models and you know, make sure everyone sees what a cool job they're doing writing their models. Um, the problem there is that MacBooks aren't necessarily the best for training models on. And they're just horrible for serving models. Um, so what are we to do when we want to deploy to production? <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> <sighs> Great success. <laughs> so what is Kubeflow? Cool. Can I have the clicking machine? Yes. Ooh, fancy. Okay. So based on the name, how many people here think that Kubeflow is magic plus containers plus TensorFlow? Okay. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I'll admit the name certainly does imply that. Uh, and the nice thing about this is, while it is not just containers plus TensorFlow and magic, it does indeed offer you the potential to run TensorFlow on Kubernetes. So if that's what you came here for, you're still going to get that. So it's, it's OK. But it's not just that. Uh, it is um, the Hilton breakfast buffet of machine learning. Um, OK, that didn't go over. OK, Corral breakfast buffet. Our breakfast buffet is just not a thing in Europe. Uh, OK, whatever. <laughs> it's, it's a buffet. And it's, you can pick all kinds of different things, uh, some of which go great together. On the other hand, you maybe don't want to wrap your shrimp uh, inside of the mangoes. Um, so <laughs> there's a bunch of different tools, and not all of them fit together. Uh, and we don't necessarily tell you which ones fit together and which ones don't. That's going to be on you to figure out. Uh, but we'll, we'll give you a little bit of guidance. So, whole bunch of things, not just TensorFlow. Um, and so this is sort of some of the buffet of the options that we've got. Um, and some of these things are things that you're going to recognize as machine learning tools, right? Um, you know, PyTorch, TF Serving. Um, you might recognize Catib for, for hyperparameter tuning. Um, but there's also other things in here as well. Because it turns out that uh, as cool as it is to just sit around and write TensorFlow code, um, there's this whole thing about like data which is really inconvenient because it's always like garbage. Um, and then I have to spend all of my time turning this garbage data into something that isn't so I can do something cool. And so you'll see there's a whole bunch of other tools as well for transforming our data and getting it into a state where we can use these cool machine learning tools. Uh, and then there's some tools to chain it all together so that it's not just like I remember vaguely that I ran this script and then this script and then uh, fuck. Yeah, right, so we have, we have Argo. OK, cool. So we can train all kinds of different libraries, uh, sorry, models uh, with, with our different tools. Um, if you just want to use like Jupyter and, and train models from your Python notebooks, that's totally doable. Uh, and then you can put them in a pipeline and, and have them actually be reproducible. Uh, we have PyTorch jobs and TensorFlow jobs, very, very useful. Uh, and we have hyperparameter tuning that can run on top of these things. Um, and there is add-ons. Um, H2O is the example that I found when I searched for Kubeflow component uh, minus Google. Um, and uh, so H2O is, was that result. Um, that being said, uh, the, the, the CI is failing, so I, I don't know if it works. Um, but uh, it's an exciting opportunity to try code from random strangers on the internet uh, in production. Uh, OK, cool. 
And right, uh, it's we also have data preparation. Uh, the last time we gave this talk, uh, there weren't really all that many data preparation tools integrated into Kubeflow. Um, Apache Spark got added as of February 14th, 2019. Uh, that's really cool. It's in the master branch, which means that it probably compiles. Uh, but I don't make a lot of promises beyond that. Uh, so if you, if you want to go ahead and try and use Spark with Kubeflow, uh, feel free to call me when it breaks. Um, and I'll be happy to let that call go to voicemail and email you back um, and try and fix your problems. Uh, and there's other tools like, like Pachyderm. And of course, you can always uh, use shell scripts. Yay, everyone loves shell scripts. Um, and then there's also TensorFlow Transform, which is a really, really cool tool. Um, the only slight problem with it is uh, if you want to, yeah, Python 2 only. Yeah, mm. kicking it old school. <laughs> no, yeah, OK, OK. <laughs> Some people like the <laughs> 90s. Um, and it's also, right now, unfortunately, doesn't do distributed fitting unless you're running on top of Google Cloud, which, as someone who works for Google Cloud, very lovely. Um, however, for, for people who maybe want to deploy things on-prem, um, not, not perfect. It's, that's something that people are actively working on fixing. Um, and I think that's going to be working in distributed mode really soon. Uh, but that is not like a product announcement of something working, because I get in trouble when I make those, because <laughs> I'm wrong. OK, cool. And so we get our data together, we train our model, and we want to persist it somewhere. So uh, well, we also maybe want to keep track of you know, what version of our model we're using in production. Um, so first option, we can use our favorite cloud storage provider and just make a directory called latest underscore two for real. Uh, and we can put our models there, and you know, that'll be great. Um, we can make latest underscore three uh, when we got a new model coming in. Uh, OK, so maybe not ideal. Um, and then there's some other tools. Uh, you can use ModelDB. Uh, there's also, you can use Pachyderm to just copy your model into cloud storage and be happy. Um, and if you're actually interested in trying to solve this problem, uh, this is a problem that is actively being worked on inside of Kubeflow. And it's on the developer discussion list as to how to best do model management. Uh, for now, just use your favorite cloud storage object provider and hope for the best. Yay! OK, cool. So we stored our model somewhere, and now we want to serve it. Uh, so we got a whole bunch of different options for serving as well. Um, if you like wrote some custom model with some custom code, that's really, really special. I'm very happy. Uh, you have an exciting opportunity to use Flask in production, uh, which it tells you explicitly not to do. Uh, but that should not stop you, uh, <laughs> apparently. Uh, and then there's, there's like prepackaged model servers if you train things that can actually be served by them. Selden serves a whole bunch of different types of models. So if you had, for example, trained a model with Spark ML for some reason, once again, maybe just wanting to kick it old school, uh, you could serve your Spark models with Selden. And it also has a bunch of things on top of it to do like A-B testing, uh, which is you know kind of useful to make sure that you're not destroying the world uh, or going to get paged, uh, right? Mm. You don't want, you don't want any of that. So maybe, maybe you look at all this and you're like, well, that sounds like a dumpster fire, but sign me up. <laughs> uh, cool. So what do we want to do? The first thing that we want to do ooh, is click on this cat video. Uh, okay, yeah. I did promise a fresh cat video. So this is a cat. Uh, this cat video has never been seen before on the internet. Fresh content. That's how you know I care about y'all. Uh, it's from Trevor's backyard. Right? Front yard. Front yard. Front okay, yard. Nest cam. Ah, Google product. Thanks. Mm. Good job. <laughs> Bye, Google. OK. So um, the first thing that you want to do, though, is step away from the keyboard. And that's because Kubeflow has so many different components, it's possible to accidentally summon Cthulhu by wiring them together in the wrong order. Um, that can be unpleasant and is not included in the basic support contracts that you'll buy. You'll have to go platinum plus or higher. And that starts to get kind of expensive. Um, so you want to think about the kind of models that you want to train, and then look at the different tools that can generate those kind of models for you, and pick the ones that you're most comfortable with. If you have no idea what your data looks like, um, that's totally normal. Um, now is your exciting, fun time to play around in Jupyter uh, and poke at your data and see what, uh, what it actually looks like. And Jupyter Hub is integrated into Kubeflow, so you can do this in a nice, happy environment. And you can also download your data locally and, and play with it there and, and have fun. Um, and so hopefully, you'll come up with an idea vaguely of the things that you want to use together, and, and we'll start that party. 
Uh, okay, the clicky thing now appears to just be for cats. Uh, okay, cool. So maybe you look at this stuff and you're like, no, 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 Holden. I came to this talk because it said Kubeflow, and I just want TensorFlow on Kubernetes. Stop trying to tell me about all of these other things I can do. I just want TensorFlow on Kubernetes. So okay, that's that's fine. Um, inside of a case on net application, this is the magic incantation you will copy and paste along with exporting version number 0 0.4.1 uh, to receive TensorFlow on Kubernetes. Yay! <laughs> If this is all you came for, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, OK, but maybe you look at that and you're like, no, no. What do, what do the people that work on Kubeflow recommend? What is the, the standard tools that people use? Uh, and so there's this thing called Kubeflow Control, or, or KFCTL. Um, and we can use it to make a new Kubeflow project. And it will install a bunch of default components for us. Um, and also this, this whole generate platform, apply platform thing, uh, if you're doing it on top of Google Cloud, it can also automatically create your Kubernetes cluster for you and set up a whole bunch of SSL certificates, um, sometimes incorrectly. Uh, it turns out that when you put magic inside of shell scripts, it doesn't go so great. Um, so, you know, hit or miss on the, on the platform part, but the, the Kubernetes part, that, that part, that part's tested, um, so it, it at least compiles. Okay, and then also because I work on Spark, and we said there was going to be a guest appearance by Spark, we'll, we'll install Spark as well, right? You know, why not? <laughs> Boost my usage numbers. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and we'll connect to our fancy web UI. Yay! Uh, and this is this is some of the components. Um, there are more components that have been deployed alongside. Uh, these are just the ones which have web UIs, right? That we can we can reasonably interact with. Um, and you don't have to do port forwarding if you use Google's identity aware proxy, uh, but that's a story for uh, 20 plus minutes of waiting for SSL certificates to download. Mm. Uh, okay, cool. So what is inside of the Chef's recommended pairing? It's Jupyter Hub, it's a TensorFlow job, TF Serving, uh, PyTorch, Catib, which can be used on top of these other components, um, the Ambassador, which lets us access the web UIs, and pipelines, which is more or less some stuff on top of Argo to make it look nice. Um, so if you're familiar with Argo, it's OK. Uh, you can just roll with that. Or if you're like, you know what? That magic incantation sounded scary. I don't want to type those things into a console. Or when I did, it gave me a bunch of error messages about not having packages installed. Um, my employer, in their glorious wisdom, has provided a uh, click, click button machine to deploy Kubeflow at deploy.kubeflow.cloud. Uh, it will deploy Kubeflow on Google Cloud. This is what it looks like. Um, it's, yeah, you sign in with Google and you will receive one Kubeflow. Um, although if you press the button twice, you may receive two or more Kubeflows, which may not be what you want. Um, so do go and check your Kubernetes clusters to see how many instances of Kubeflow has been created. Because uh, in this case, each time we press create deployment, it tries to create another set of Kubernetes clusters for us. Very, yeah, helpful, helpful. Um, this identity aware proxy means if we set it up, uh, everything is awesome. Uh, we can access our web UI with our like Gmail tokens. We don't have to do any, uh, sorry, Google Cloud credentials. Uh, we don't have to do any manual port forwarding. There's like a nice fancy web UI that I can go to. The only problem is when it fails, uh, yeah, there's no real logging messages that tell you why it failed. Um, and so it's an exciting opportunity to go and figure out how to connect to your Kubernetes cluster anyways, because it didn't work. Uh, and you're going to have to fix it. Um, but if it works for you, that's great, right? Like, good job. Um, the only downside is if it fails to deploy, you probably have to delete your cluster and start over. Ooh, sad. OK. Um, but so let's maybe skip that for now, because maybe let's go down the path which isn't going to take 20 minutes and may or may not fail. Uh, without an error message. So we disable IIP, and we deploy a regular Kubeflow. We press button, I receive a Kubernetes cluster. Um, actually, here the logging messages are for two different Kubernetes clusters, and I'm about to deploy a third, because uh, cloud resources are free when you work at Google. Um, <laughs> and uh, here's the cloud console shell. Oh, right, yeah. Um, there's a wonderful underdocumented feature. Uh, wherein uh, if you have multiple accounts uh, in Google uh, signed in, and if you use your deploy Kubeflow when you press the sign in with Google button, if the account that you pick is not the first in the list, uh, 
nonetheless, it will try and open a cloud shell in the first account, which will not have permission to talk to your clusters. Um, <clears throat> And it is not necessarily super clear that that is what has happened. Um, and the solution to that is um, it, you can, it will try and run this like cloud shell open command. You'll see it, it will fail, and you'll be like, oh, okay, cool. I'm gonna copy and paste this, go and open a cloud shell manually, and run that command. And now you have received your Kubeflow cluster. Yay! Okay, I thought that was a success. <laughs> okay, so. We have a cluster, that's exciting. Uh, we could do things with it, possibly, right? Um, like build a pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so Trevor's gonna talk about pipelines. Um, pipelines are, uh, this is somehow related because that is a pipe, I think. Uh, <laughs> and I like cats. Okay. <laughs> uh, you want a clicky thing? Yep. So, what are these pipelines? Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, it doesn't have a clock anymore. Oh, okay, we're good. Uh, so what are these pipelines? <clears throat> they're, they're graphs. They're directed acyclic graphs um, that uh, are easier to show you. So here we see one. Um, this is a very simple, not machine learning, but it is part of the pipelines um, dashboard in Kubeflow when you all go home and install this and start playing with it yourself. Um, there's a coin flip. Um, random numbers are generated and you have an output and each of the white boxes, there's like the white and the off-white, I think we can see, yeah, um, those are all individual Docker containers. So it's a, direct, a directed acyclic graph of Docker containers that just is a set of instructions and this and that. Um, so that's what the pipeline is. This is composed with YAML files and I think maybe they're working on a graphic editor or I don't know. Maybe. Someday one that may sounds exist. sounds cool. Yeah. Um, but the animals aren't terrible. Um, here's one. Oh, oh, so here's the output as it runs. The flip is tails, and then it generates the number 16, which is greater than 15. So two, um, yeah. <gasps> so exciting. <Just> <laughs> Everything we always wanted in our machine learning frameworks. Um, okay. This is a graph of maybe a more legit machine learning type of job where you've got your data validation coming in and pre-processing and training and then that model gets deployed but also you're looking at prediction and you're analyzing the model um, and looking at confusion matrices and all of these things so that is maybe uh, that's how you would use this in real life um, does anyone deploy their models currently with pipelines well, there you go. Does anyone currently use Kubeflow? Okay, so that's two of us. Okay. Three, I do too. Oh, three, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and this, so this is a thing that, um, data science, again, has kind of hit that point where everyone does it. There's, there's a million, there's more data scientists than there are, the, the economics of it are a little off, but, um, there's plenty of data scientists, and the question is, how do we get models into production? And these are the sort of things you're gonna start seeing as answers to that question of, how do we deploy models into production? How do we analyze them? Um, when we're looking at models that are serving in real time, how do, they, how do we know that they're starting to break down? And in these pipelines, you could start saying like, you know, if we guess wrong over 20% of the time, that's a deal breaker, and we need to just stop, like just start 404ing because the service is too bad. Someone should have looked at it by now. But send me an email when we start missing 10% of the time. Or things of that nature, just ex hip shot examples of how you'd use pipelines. Um, Catib is, uh, so going back to how we're both cloud providers and happy to sell you as much cloud resources as you need, um, searching hyperparameter spaces. So if you know much, if you've ever done much machine learning, you know there's lots of hyperparameters and there's this tuning. And so you've got kind of like that graph, of, very similar to the graph of GPUs. You think you need to tune lots and lots of hyperparameters until you learn what you're doing and you just kind of develop a gut feeling for it. And you know like on this sort of problem, I feel like on this model, these parameters need to be set. You can start with a sort of logical space and you just run the model yourself a couple times. But people who don't know what they're doing, oh man, oh man, they want to run through the entire feasible set of hyperparameters 
do a complete set. And when you start having people who really know what they're doing and in their, their esoteric situations using maybe gray and black box models that there isn't really much guidelines on what the hyperparameter should be. That's another time that you need to start doing hyperparameter tuning. Um, and for both of those people, we have Ketib, which is an integral part of Kubeflow. You can run experiments left and right, see how models are performing, um, and so on and so forth. It is a great way to overfit if you are the new data scientist. Be careful of that. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah, seriously, this... you. You'll, we'll sell you a lot of cloud on this. So if you're talking to Google or IBM sales, please mention our names. We're both uh, gunning for a promotion, so that would help out a lot. Thank you. <laughs> this is a screenshot of the CADEB UI. Um, again, this is, it's going to be generating a, um, a YAML. It is a UI for generating the YAML of the experiment you're going to run. The YAML's at the right, and uh, just your inputs at the left. But wait, my company has some very special esoteric yak shaving tool that we need, that it's integral to all of our pipelines and everything we do, we must have it. And so how do we get that into Kubeflow? Why it's easy. Anything you can put in a Docker file, you can use in Kubeflow on those pipelines. So this is just an example of how easy it is to insert about one, two, Two lines in a Docker file, and boom, um, one line of command line. Yeah, so. and now your Fortran code will never die. Not that <laughs> it was going to. <laughs> we make new tools to work around Fortran, not new languages to work around tools. Um, so we have some live stream demos of things that existed, um, that still exist. If you're interested in maybe going more into the weeds, uh, we are also, Holden and I are putting on a workshop in San Francisco next week uh, as part of Strata. And we have a special limited time opportunity for everyone in this room as a thank you for coming to our <laughs> talk. And that opportunity is for free of charge, talk to us after the talk and we will give you access to run your own, to run this demo and on your own time and give us feedback and let us know that we need what was unclear, what we need to fix, what will you learn? Installing Kubeflow, setting up a project, deploying the project to multiple clouds, including Google, IBM, maybe Azure. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the Microsoft people have not come through with the free accounts yet. So um, <laughs> that one's got an asterisk next to it. Um, and monkeying around with a project and still having it not totally break and go off the rails. So, yes, please come talk to us after. Um, we'd be more than happy to set you up with that and to answer questions that you don't have because you might be embarrassed during the question and answer section. Sure. So. All right. so that's great. This is all of the many benefits of Kubeflow, but why shouldn't we use Kubeflow? Uh, so there's sort of three core reasons. Uh, one is it adds a lot of overhead, and it does this in, in two different ways. Uh, there's the overhead of running everything in Docker. If I'm just deploying things on my MacBook, uh, this is an excellent way to turn my MacBook into a space heater. Um, very, very nice space heater, but maybe not what you were looking to do. Um, the other one is there's a lot more overhead involved in getting started, right? Uh, you presumably can start Jupyter Notebook relatively easily on your machine and start playing around with models really, really quickly. Um, getting started with Kubeflow takes a little bit longer. Um, this is, however, the price of us building portable, scalable pipelines. Um, when the, the speed that you get from doing it locally is by just sort of picking whatever dependencies happen to be on your machine and calling that good. The problem is your MacBook may not be representative of a Ubuntu, CoreOS, or whatever container image is being deployed in production, right? And this may cause a lot of problems later down, uh, later on downstream. Um, Kubeflow is also under active development and like really, really active development. It is 0 0.4 and uh, considering ripping out core, core components and replacing them with new ones, because that sounds fun. Um, and like the right thing to do for very solid technical reasons. Uh, but there's a good chance that if you like spend a lot of time building a Kubeflow project, you're going to have an exciting time to rebuild your Kubeflow project uh, by the end of this year. 
Um, we're, as mentioned, we are working on a book. We should have put that like slide there so that people can go and give oh, us their email addresses. I thought it was still a secret. Addresses. No, it's not secret. Wait, oh. is it secret? Oh, crap. Uh, give us your email addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. <laughs> uh, I think it's not secret. I'll bring, I'll bring up that, that thing in a little bit. But I predict that all of the examples that we've written for our book so far mm. will have to be rewritten by the end of the year. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is, right? Um, and that's not that you won't learn useful things doing this, and it's not that your pipeline will break, it's just that your upgrade experience is going to be uh, delightful. Um, the last one is three different talks on Kubeflow can give you three completely different tool sets. Um, and this is, this is both good and bad, right? Kubeflow is very flexible, but if you don't really need that flexibility, uh, that's a lot of choices to have to make, and that can, that can lead to sort of an indecision. Um, and if what really what you want is, like, I have a data set, I want to upload it and receive magical recommendations to give to my boss, maybe you want something like CloudML or, or the IBM version of that. What's it called? Uh, Watson ML. Okay, I Watson ML, assume. right? You, whatever. <laughs> you want some magic black box to upload data to to blame when it goes wrong, right? And in those cases, you probably don't need Kubeflow. You, you only really need Kubeflow if you want to actually control what you're doing uh, and have fun with it. Okay, um, so this is time for questions, a half-baked demo, or actually the more important one, where I try and collect your email addresses. Uh, intro to M, uh, do you remember what the domain name is called? Intro to Kubeflow? Hmm. Uh, that cloud? <laughs> no, <laughs> I think it's like intro to ML with Kubeflow. Can I take a question <laughs> while Holden tries to guess our website? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Anyone? it's question time. Oh, question cool. up here. How does it work on Windows? How does it work on Windows? I doubt that it does. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've never tried. Um, in, the way you would do it in Windows is um, using Google Cloud Platform, I would say, or to any cloud provider, you're not going to be deploying your own Kubernetes on Windows to begin with. You just need a way to, then you would SSH into however you would normally access your server that is doing your thing, would be my answer. So, uh, other questions? Yes. Which Spark version? Which Spark version? Ah, yes. Um, I think the version, so the, the way how Spark is, is integrated into Kubeflow right now, is it's the based on the Google Spark operator uh, for Kubernetes, and that supports multiple versions of Spark, just not at the same time, um, which is okay. So you can like two, th uh, two, three plus should work inside of that operator. Um, you so if you want to use two, three or two, four, you can use it. Uh, there's a parameter to set, um, and you'll you'll just have to configure it to whichever version you want. Uh, and the, the wonderful website that you should all go to is introduction to ml with kubeflow.com. And you should definitely uh, give us your email address, first name, and last name. And because we're in Europe and I enjoy not getting sued, you should check all of these boxes at the bottom. <laughs> um, and yes, you should definitely do that. And you will receive uh, exclusively business-related correspondence in accordance with EU regulations. <laughs> yes, uh, I think the IPs are recorded, so I know which people I can spam mercilessly or not, uh, based on whether or not you're coming from America. So you're, you're all safe. Um, <laughs> do, we, do we have more questions? It works, yeah? <laughs> well, define works. <laughs> like, you can make Kubeflow work, yes. Um, will every component in Kubeflow work out of the box? Oh, hell no, right? Um, it is, it's an 0.4 release, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there are random things that are broken in random situations. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the state of the world. Um, it's, it's getting better, and if you file issues, those will get fixed. But um, expect to find issues as you go on your adventure. Okay, I think we're, we're out of time. Uh, so everyone should go to introduction to ml with kubeflow.com 
give us your email addresses. And hopefully about 10 of you are really excited about that tr special offer Trevor was talking about to help us debug a workshop for next week. We'll uh, see you up here. Or sorry, uh, <laughs> learn more about Kubeflow. Uh, that's, that's what we were saying. And come find me. I'm wearing a uh, shark, shark fin. Yeah, okay. Thanks. <laughs>